Dave Aranda's first full and complete recruiting class is now on the field this season for Baylor football. Who are the top two or three guys that can make an impact right away? This is Locked On Baylor. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Locked on Baylor, and I want to take time to thank LinkedIn Talent Solutions for bringing on John Garcia Jr. today. LinkedIn Talent Solutions is the best way to find employees fast. Go to LinkedInTalentSolutions.com and use the code Locked On. John Garcia Jr., Sports Illustrated, joins the show today to talk all things Baylor football, and especially those young guys are Baylor's team this year. We thank you for making Locked on Baylor your first listen every single day. And John, I, there are some some beasts, not even just for Baylor standards, but in general that came in in this last class, a couple of four-star guys that it feels like in positions such as Armani Winfield, wide receiver, Kyan Roberts Day, tight end, where Baylor needs a couple guys and some more depth that, that they could step up right away. 100 percent you know and that's what you recruit at a higher level for it, it is certainly still about development and addressing needs but you need that pop you need that instant impact uh, potential and i think you know it's it comes in various you know shapes and sizes but obviously for this class of 2022 you're looking at the offense first right we, we kind of feel like look baylor defense like they're good. Like we, we feel like it's a safe bet under Dave Aranda. And look, the, the whole front seven, I think, is just about returning. So you got to feel good about the bear unit in that regard. Uh, some experience coming back in the secondary as well. But certainly on offense, in the skill position, you know, slots, there is some time or some space, I should say, for some freshmen to make an impact. And Arm Armani Winfield is, is where that conversation begins. You lost what your top three receivers. Yeah, I think it's like top seven or something. I, it's you look <laughs> at the receiver four, room and six. say, "Oh, yeah, great." <laughs> yeah, uh, and and Winfield, he's he's really not like any one of those guys who left. You know, he doesn't have the speed of Thornton or or some of the the all around game, but there's a balance to his game. He is big, mm -hmm. he is physical, he is polished. Just the type of kid who comes in ready to go. He, he's not going to be the flashiest guy that you give a jet sweep to and he goes 80 yards. Most likely. Now, maybe he'll prove me wrong and, and that's fine. But most conventionally, he's going to be that in the margins guy. The intermediate routes where you, you need a guy on third and six. You need a guy to absorb some contact or win at the catch point. This is the type of player that that you're going to trot out there. So our money Winfield is reliable. He's physical uh, and he's polished. I think things that you have to have as a freshman wide receiver in order to make an impact uh, in, in day one and I guess year one uh, at the collegiate level, obviously the former uh, Texas verbal commitment. So the the flip there, uh, I think the need at the position and and in theory, the more maybe balanced approach we're going to see from Baylor in 2022, I think will help, uh, you know, push more towards the passing game. So there's going to be a whole lot of novelty and, and newness, new feel with that passing unit uh, with, with shaping at QB one. And I think Winfield could be a big beneficiary. And then with Roberts day, it's just like, no matter where he lined up, right. We saw him at running back in high school, tight end is the projection. He, he could rush the passer. You just knew he was going to find his way on the field somehow, some yeah. way. And I know Baylor brings back a couple of tight ends, but whether you hand him the ball, you're allowing him to catch passes in the flats or even block where, where that defensive acumen kind of comes into play even more, particularly in space, you got to get this kid on the field. He is just a physical specimen at you know, 6'3", 240 pounds or whatever he is listed at at this point. Uh, he's just one of those guys who's a football player. And, and if there's anything that Dave Aranda would appreciate, it's it's a football player, a guy who doesn't have to be pigeonholed into one position and can utilize you know any spot on the field and, and create some success for the offense. So I think whether it's as a blocker, as a gadget player, uh, as maybe even a fullback at times, because you know nobody recruits fullbacks. Those are just tight ends anyway way that you move down robert stay is going to find his way onto the field in, in some way shape or form and i got a sleeper for you drake i think all right all if right you go to the defense that secondary can use some some volume and some depth to a degree and 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 when he committed to baylor last uh i think it was like january he was one of the later additions i was like man that's a fit this is a fit alfonso allen the safety from my neck of the woods in miami florida He's a physical, old school, downhill type of player. So whether it's as a traditional safety or special teams or as some kind of hybrid where he's working downhill and, and can help uh, 
set the tone for what Baylor wants to be defensively. I think Alfonso finds his way on the field. I, I was uh, stalking his social media a little bit, and I saw that he was uh, like the lifter of the day, you know, before preseason camp. You know, strong physical kid who's really embodying that 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 new perception, I would say, of of the Baylor Bears. So I think he finds his way to make an impact. Maybe it's as simple as special teams, but of course, Aranda will tell you that that's a big deal because it's one of the three phases of the game. So excited to see how these young guys look. Of course. John, I am fishing uh, on this next one completely. So I, I see, you know, our money Winfield is a is a Texas guy, and even with Alfonso Allen, who's a Florida guy, I know that when you list your top five states in high school football, those two states are certainly in the top three. <laughs> There's that dog again. I there love when that happens. <laughs> uh, those two states are certainly in the top three. Do you see? Look, yes or no? Shoot me straight. Do you see a a larger gap? for guys making the adjustment coming from high school football in a state, say Arkansas, where I'm from, compared to the guys in Texas that have competed with Texas level of competition? That's a great question, Drake. And I think, yeah, to a degree, there's a gap. But I think with the structure of the high school football off seasons, uh, these camps, combines, events that these kids individually are able to participate in, we, we get to see that gap closed a little bit before they ever depart high school. And then on top of that, the the calendar, right? These guys who are early enrollees and they get a whole round of spring ball before their freshman season, you know, in the fall, those kids are also able to, to play a little bit more uh, of the catch-up game. But yeah, I think all things even, if you're talking about kids who aren't well-traveled in the offseason and they enroll in the summer, yeah, the kids from Texas and Florida, Georgia, I mean, yeah, those kids, New Orleans, those kids are a little bit more apt to, to playing early and competing early, at least physically, at least from a physical standpoint, because they're going against other, most likely, FBS or Power 5 recruits at least every other Friday, if not every single Friday night, d depending on their position. So, yeah, I do think that there's a bit of a gap there, but there's so many other elements of recruiting nowadays that help uh, to, to close those margins, particularly in the offseason and with the calendar allowing these guys to, to get on board so early. John, the, the transfer portal has not been as crazy. I have to remind myself how new these new transfer portal rules are, that this really just started and guys are already using it to the utmost advantage. I think it's a big positive for a lot of college football players. On the back end, to me, it feels like so many freshmen are going to lose immediate opportunities they would have had when the fourth-year guy from Buffalo transfers to Florida. Are you already seeing that make an impact on how many freshmen are stepping on the football field? 100%. I think, you know, there's there's certain positions where you you always kind of bank on freshmen getting a chance, right? Wide receiver, pass rusher, you know, where you can kind of simplify the role or be situational. And I think in both of those uh, samples, you can. I think kick returner, punt returner as well is another one. You usually see, hey, you know, we, this guy's not quite there yet, but man, we can get him. We can get him a few touches a game as a returner or as a slot receiver. We could just hand him the ball, something like that. Those small, you know, expectations are beginning to to get tweaked. I think that's it's a really great point. Uh, we're seeing it across college football. We used to expect these quarterbacks to come in and compete as freshmen or second year players at the latest, but now if you look like you're one of the schools that's in line to play a freshman. The fan base panics, the coaching staff reshuffles the yeah. deck in the portal and you bring in, you know, maybe the group of five quarterback who's who's got, you know, 50 touchdowns to his name at the collegiate level already or the guy who loses a battle at, you know, USC or one of these other schools. So I do think that there's a little bit less of that true no brainer, true freshman impact. And the portal's certainly a, a big reason why. That's, that's a really great point. I haven't heard um, broken down in depth. But, yeah, we're, we're seeing that. I, I was asked on another show and also to contribute to a preseason All-America list uh, for true freshman or freshman All-American. And it was hard. It was really hard to try to figure out depth chart-wise and situationally where it's like, hey, 15 snaps a game. Can, can you flash in those 15 snaps? Yes, the talent is there. Let's give this kid a nod. But there wasn't a whole lot of yes, he will be the starter or he yeah. will be in that rotation 100% of the time. Uh, and, and it's an easy call here. And I think the portal is is probably the main reason for, for the lack of at least no brainer examples early on in, in this 2022 uh, prediction talking point type season. 
Well, John, there are a lot of high school football players in the state of Texas, turns out. I have yeah. been, I'm doing some research, and there's a lot of those guys, uh, many of whom are, are Division One caliber. And I know a lot of Baylor fans are already looking toward this next class, even in 23, with a few guys that are still left over. I know David Rayner probably wants to you know, get one or two more on board. And then 2024 as well. I want to get into those classes, especially in the state with Baylor's target guys. But first, I've got to tell the folks at home about LinkedIn's LinkedIn, Locked On's newest sponsor, LinkedIn. So I'll tell you this, be transparent. I, um, I've i been in this like PR writing class. Remember, I'm a senior and it is, it's hard. It is really, really hard. And I have, you know, China Spring High School football games on Friday night. So I decided I need somebody to help with graphics, with video work. I, I just need some help here in some ways when it comes to everything outside of the internship that I'm currently working. So I went to LinkedIn. Ah, look at that. See, you practice what you preach. I went to LinkedIn and it's the best way to find the right people for your team. So Jackson, if you're out there listening, thank you for helping set all of this up. You create a free job post in minutes. 810 million people have used this thing. Add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame. Super easy. I can attest. I'm not a big technology guy. Simple tools, screening questions. They make it easy to focus the right skills and the right people you want. It's a small business. LinkedIn jobs is rated number one in de- delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. So right now, go to LinkedIn Jobs, where 40 million job seekers go every day. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. Keep in mind that terms and conditions do apply. John, uh, dude, I'm happy. I got, there's a, there is an intern guy that is doing some work Look over here. I, it, it's a long time coming, um, and make it a quick buck. Look, everybody wins. Everybody wins. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, Baylor wins a lot now, which is not always the historically has not been the case. I have come to this, this crossroads of will Baylor in recruiting, especially in a state like Texas, become an Iowa state. Here's my example. When's the last time Iowa state was a top 10 recruiting team in the nation? Probably no. never in the history of America, right. but they still have been able to field these top 10, top 15 teams the last few years, despite not recruiting at an elite level. Do you see Baylor, especially as not the biggest or even second biggest brand in Texas, following suit to a school like that? Yeah, I'll go outside the Big 12 and and, and give you a few more that are kind of in that same ballpark. And I, and I love that kind of thought process, right? Because it's, it's Baylor. Look, you, you, it's not going to be five-star you. It's not going to be... Let's yeah. go into Miami and get the best player in floor. It, it's not going to be that. But the the Iowa states of the world have certainly done more with less. How about Iowa? How about Michigan State, yeah. Wisconsin, uh, Utah? I mean, Utah <laughs> beat Oregon twice last year with guys that Oregon, in theory, overlooked on, on the recruiting trail, um, including in the Pac-12 title game. So you can be especially and, – and what those schools all have in common, right, defense – and and kind of this this traditional balance mentality of we're going to play modern football from a schematic standpoint, but it's going to be with a more conservative, balanced offensive approach on top of that. So you can win double digit games every single year with that mentality, even in the age of the air raid and you know Mike Leach throwing it sixty times a game. You can still do yeah. it in another way, but you've got to develop. You've got to identify great talent and then develop it in a culture that's kind of easy to sell and and buy into. And I think all those other programs have the other element of recruiting that is becoming more and more valuable. It's stability. It is the lack of worry of, hey, if I go to School X, if I go to Wisconsin, I'm not worried about Chris getting another job. I'm not worried about the culture changing. I'm not worried about this thing flipping upside its head. Uh, same thing at Iowa with Ference, Utah with Whittingham. These are well-tenured coaches, even, even Iowa State with Matt Campbell, even though he's on every list every year for you know for, for these, these new jobs that open up. If yeah. Dave Aranda can become that next coach and, and Baylor can be that next school, the stability cell of Baylor on top of what we get on the field and that perception and, and has it, as it builds together will be just as important as any of those elements. So, yes, when you do recruit, you can sell something that you don't get at Texas, that you're not getting anymore at Oklahoma, uh, which are your main you know regional recruiting rivals. So that becomes very much more important, especially when you talk about premium position guys, quarterbacks. 
They talk to me about stability as much as scheme, opportunity, depth chart. They don't want to go and play for three offensive coordinators or multiple head coaches if they don't have to. So I think that is becoming one of the equalizers in in college football recruiting. So that's a really great point. And you want to be one of those schools. You want to be a school that's considered almost safe in how people look at you because with the volatility elsewhere, you you can kind of stay in the race and and have an opportunity to close at the end of these recruitments, just like we've seen Baylor do in 22 and and maybe even better here in 2023. John, that was my nice way of saying, please don't give me any five-star guys here unless they're very (laughs) reasonable five-star guys from like Midway High School. Uh, the players in Texas that Baylor fans can look out for out of even out of the class of 23, but I know 24 becomes more of the focus now that 23 is starting to almost completely lock up. Right. Who are who are those guys that Baylor fans should at least have have in their head? Well, it looks like there's a little bit more room in the secondary for Baylor in this in this class of 23. You know, I know Caden Jenkins out of uh, Louisville, Texas is one. He's got a brother who's who's on a major radar as well. Baylor is in the top five for each. Uh, he was talking about a late summer decision. So maybe now he pushes that thing into the fall just a little bit. So you wonder how much Baylor could be pushing in that regard. And, and ditto for Jamal Shaw, big uh, safety out of West Orange Stark, which has produced – some big time safeties in the past, right? Earl Thomas, Deontay Thompson, uh, among others. He's kind of next safety up there. Houston has some buzz with him, but Baylor's gotten him on campus uh, several times. So again, you wonder if the ball is in Baylor's court there as well, Drake. And then two more in in the class of 23. How about Torian York, who you you might say, hey, isn't he committed to Baylor? Yes, he is. But other schools continue to push for him. So he is a Texan. He is committed. But I do think Baylor needs to continue to recruit him at a relatively high clip. I know Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin are a program that recently offered that he's talking about taking an official visit to. So not only uh, acquisition, but retention important in recruiting uh, You know, down the stretch or uh, within uh, the, the season uh, limits. And then out of state, uh, Tyler Johnson is one to keep an eye on. He's probably among all these guys the one closest to ending the recruiting process. Big offensive lineman out of Louisiana, um, Baylor, Auburn, Texas Tech, all in that group committing September 2nd. So if there is to be a new Baylor edition in the next week or so, maybe Tyler Johnson is that prospect. And and he has really switched it up. He was talking about really taking his time, taking game visits and all that kind of stuff. And now he set this September 2nd verbal commitment date, which is interesting because he's only taken – two officials first to Baylor and then two weeks later to Texas Tech in the month of June so maybe some more beef coming on the offensive line uh, for BU here at the end of 2023 so those are the the, the positions O-line linebacker and, and defensive back I think where you could see a little bit more juice in 2023 and with 2024 it's so early obviously there's a, a ton of prospects on the board I think quarterback is is naturally where you begin that process you know DJ Lagway still out there everybody wants him AM, uh Texas TCU Florida is his most recent visit and they're starting to feel good about that recruitment um uh Mabry Motter uh, out of the Woodlands Texas is another one with a billion scholarship offers he's one I think uh, worth keeping an eye on uh, for Baylor and just about every other school in need of a quarterback so it won't be easy and this will be new for Baylor it won't be easy to follow up landing Austin Novosad because he's a name, he's an SI-99 recruit, and kids in the next cycle will see that at quarterback. What do quarterbacks look at? Depth charts. What is my path towards playing at school X? Uh, so when you do sign a big-time quarterback, a blue-chip quarterback, like you you probably will here with Novosad, how do you follow that up? That will always be an intriguing element of building a successful program because it's hard to follow up very good QBs with another one in that same stratosphere the next recruiting cycle. So for me, quarterback will be fascinating for Baylor in the class of of 2024. And of course, there's a lot of available uh, and different type of talents available in in the state of Texas. Well, John, I want to round out the show uh, by if football is back and to all of our listeners in Texas as well today, happy Friday, everybody, Texas high school football is back in full swing. You are in week one of Texas high school football. And so almost every team, if not every team in the state, is suiting it up and running out this week. So enjoy that tonight. If you don't have a local high school to go to, you do. Just go find one and sit sit there because it is epic. And as that gets kicked off, it obviously signifies week zero of the college football season. John, I I love to reserve these third segments for just John's thoughts that aren't like – 
<laughs> while that don't have to be football technical. Football coming back on Saturday. What are you, super broad, looking forward to to most? Well, we've got one Power Five on Power Five matchup, right, in Dublin with Northwestern and Nebraska. Never been this excited to watch two teams coming off of uh, three win seasons, but here we are. You know, Scott yeah. Frost, hot seat, new offense. Casey Thompson is going to be QB1 there. He won that quarterback battle. What does that look like? Uh, I think they got to get going offensively. But, you know, at Northwestern, you know, speaking of stability, Pat Fitzgerald's been there forever. Every couple years, you know, they they make a big run. And if and when they do that, it starts on defense. So I think you're going to get a bit of a good on good when Nebraska's offense is on the field. And, and that will be such a critical game with so much at stake particularly for Scott Frost uh, and Nebraska. And then there's some interesting debuts. Um, Jim Moore at UConn, they've actually got some buzz there. Utah State, who they're playing, has a bunch of good transfers, which you wouldn't normally right. expect. Uh, Florida State's kicking it off. A big year for Mike Norvell and company. Uh, if we're talking about craziness in the coaching carousel, Nebraska comes to mind. But Florida State is another one where there's a lot of talk. And this entire offseason, it's been about the other teams in Florida, Miami, and the Gators under their new coaches recruiting incredibly well and above that level of Florida State. So how does FSU now counter on the field ahead of, of that big week one matchup against LSU, where, of course, there's plenty more at stake for both parties. So uh, a little bit of everything this weekend, uh, only 10 or 11 games. But you can if you're a college football buff, you can really find a lot of storylines to dig into. But overall, Drake, just happy to see this thing come back. Let's be honest. It's it's like the Christmas that lasts for three months, because when it's not in that three months, it is just this grueling waiting period for college football to come back. John, I will see your northwestern Nebraska and I will raise you a North Texas UTEP. The Texas. How, matchup, how could I avoid the Texas on Texas matchup? Apologies. How My could gosh. you? I when I lived in Arkansas, I would have thought, seen this game and thought, OK, I hope they have fun. I'm, I'm not buying stadium to watch it. I will be glued to this. UTEP as good as they were last year. North Texas, yeah. it feels like, is getting consistently better. Is is there one game you circle? Maybe it is even this one that you think, that's just going to be a competitive football game that I want to watch. Yeah, I mean, look, there is some action. So I will say there is some action coming up. You can never, you know, from the entertainment value, you never shy away from that. But yeah, let's let's go with UTEP North Texas. You know, uh, Lone Star State showdown. How many times are they going to say that on stadium come Saturday. Uh, so, so why not? Uh, aside from the Maction, which I think is the first game Western Kentucky's playing, they're going to throw it a hundred times in one game. Yeah. Um, outside of the Maction and the Power 5 matchup, let, let's go to the Lone Star State. Why not? Yeah, Western Kentucky, Austin P starts our day of college. It's always that one game where like, you know, Central Arkansas plays Towson and you got to really love college football if you're going to watch it. <laughs> but it's usually a pretty good game. I don't think that one will be. Uh, the other one that I want to get your thoughts on Vanderbilt and Hawaii. Again, John, none of these matchups make a lot How of sense. How about that matchup? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, <laughs> Vanderbilt has been on island for two weeks now just to acclimate themselves to the what I would also go to Hawaii for two weeks to acclimate yeah. myself to the atmosphere. Uh, do you see weird things happen on island? But I know a lot of folks really like Vandy in this matchup. Yeah, you, you got to like them just from a height, weight, uh, defensive standpoint, particularly with just uh, being an SEC member. And obviously, Hawaii is going to counter with with a really wide open attack and and probably be a little bit more comfortable in the skill position standpoint compared to, to Vandy from the trench standpoint. But yeah, I think over time, it's going to be hard uh, to for, for Hawaii to slow down what Vandy wants to do offensively they've got a returning quarterback in Mike Wright who is a dual threat who now has uh, considerable experience under his belt uh, so I do think that Vandy they, they just kind of have to get off on the right foot just like Florida State with Duquesne on the schedule you just got to get off on the right foot because you know after this it's really tough and, and you, every win is is really really critical for Vanderbilt football can you get to six you got to get to one first um, and, and obviously, you know, doing so at, at a great place like Hawaii will be fun. But Hawaii is going under some transition as well, too. So it, it's not something that you automatically rule out. Vanderbilt struggled with a lot of teams that you on paper would not have expected last year under Clark Lee. So it's it's certainly not something you just write off and, and move on from. It's, it's probably worth tuning into. John, how much football do you get to watch that's not high school football? 
A good bit. You know, uh, a lot of most high schools are, are obviously playing on Fridays. There's always some Thursday games. There's actually two Thursday games down here in, in South Florida tonight. I'll probably watch one, maybe go to the other. Uh, but Saturdays are usually relatively free. I think outside of the Northeast, like D.C. up to New York, they do play a lot of Saturday games. But we've got technology. We can record them. We can watch them on Sunday uh, in between some NFL stuff. But Saturdays are usually totally reserved for college football. Um, and it helps us too, right? Because if we're looking to reach out to recruits and there's a huge upset, you know, uh, out of Iowa upsets Ohio State at Iowa, we know that that's now something that is is more prevalent to dig into because those, those kids were able to witness it live. So that's always a fun element of this time of year because you get the combination of, hey, I'm a recruit on a business trip to, to these schools to see if I want to go here. But you also get kind of the like the fandom, you get the the fantasy of college football, the pageantry where these kids are just like, yeah, I didn't talk to the head coach, but oh my gosh, it was the best day of my life because I, my heart was beating for three hours and it was so loud and my, you know, my mom lost her voice and whatever it is, you get kind of just more human elements and emotion coming out of, of these stories. And, and, and that's really at the core of what makes college football its, its own unique thing, even though football is America's top sport and the NFL is king financially and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. The emotional, you know, toll really it takes on us at the collegiate level is is unmatched so uh that's that's really where it's fun to to dig into it well we're almost there which is super fun also that matt guy at sports illustrated awesome guys john garcia jr has been hooking this guy up with si and now i'm going to provo utah so john drinks on me to, to non-alcoholic in provo utah here in a couple weeks baylor and byu <laughs> Uh, folks, if you like John's stuff, I don't know how you wouldn't at John C at John Garcia underscore Jr. on Twitter. Go find him, Sports Illustrated SI.com. Click on the college tab, all of his stuff's there, SI99, all that. John, thanks so much. Thank you, Drake. Safe travels. And to the folks at home, thank you for listening to Locked On Baylor or watching Locked On Baylor, making it your first listener to watch every single day. I'm Drake Tollett, John Garcia Jr. Come back Monday. We're projecting every game on every schedule for every team in the Big 12. This has been Locked On Baylor.